I love doing house projects uh, within our home. I just love it. It's something that me and Kirsten have started. Uh, we started to do right away in our marriage, and it's become something that we just really, really love doing together. And uh, I'd love to say that we're good at it. I think we pretend we're good at it, but we just kind of make it up as we go. Uh, but I have some problems. See, see one, of my, one of my problems is I'm a great starter, but I'm not a great finisher. Anybody else kind of identify with that? If you walk into our home and you look close enough, you will see a bunch of 95% of the way finished projects. I don't know what it is about the last 5%, but I just can't do it. I can't finish it. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I can't. And then I've got this other problem too, and this is the one that drives Kirsten just bonkers. It drives her nuts. I am a very impatient person. Anybody else super impatient? Just so impatient. And the, the reason why this is a problem when it comes to house projects is I just jump in before I'm ready. I hate transition. I love change, but I hate the process of getting there. Anybody else? So the problem is when, when I want to do something, I jump in before I make a plan. Now, have you ever walked into a project without a plan? All y'all people out there who don't like to lay down any plastic before you paint a room, you're who I'm talking to. You're like, I'm not putting any plastic down. I will not do it. Now, it might start great. It always starts great for me. But the moment that I, bump, I hit a bump in the road, I experience a challenge. Well, then suddenly, I don't know what happens to me. I just lose my mind, and I start doing stupid things. I, I, I overly react. I find ill-suited solutions, often met with the words, ah, I did not think this through, did I? <laughs> Running out of materials, paint everywhere, a ton of wood scraps left over. I didn't think of the timeline correctly. There's a trail of, trail of trash in my wake. Now, I will get it done, well, at least 95% of the way done. But I cannot promise to you that it will complete, or when it's done, it will be what I intended it in the first place. Because I didn't take the time to make a plan. And that's what this series has been all about. Is we don't want you to walk into 2024 without a plan. We want you to walk in with vision for your life. And that's why we've been looking at Proverbs 29, 18, and we're going to read out of the King James Version, taking it old school this morning. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law happy is he. The truth is in the church, we misuse this scripture a lot. It becomes like a self-motivation mantra for us as believers i got a dream for my life. I've got to have vision for my success, vision for my family, vision for my church. And yes, all of those things are good things. But there's a road to finding the right vision in our lives. We cannot pull that vision out of the blue because it will be a patchwork idea of what we think success looks like, right? Our financial endeavors, influence, physical fitness, not that any of these things are wrong, because they might be a part of the plan, a byproduct of the plan, but they are not the plan. I love that the way the Amplified translation unpacks the scripture for, it is for us. It says, where there is no vision or amplified, no revelation of God in his word, the people are unrestrained. But happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. See, when we say vision... We're talking about the revelation of God through his word. His word is our playbook for the plan. When we're building our plan according to our vision and what we think success looks like, it's a scary thought because there isn't a magical line that you step over that suddenly brings you from unsuccessful to successful, right? It is in our human nature to always want more, to always need more. There's always a new place to get to a new level of success, a new leadership book to read. When we build our vision from here, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Because I can promise you all the accolades and the personas and the influence and the things that you think will give you value, they will leave you empty. Because there's no end to them. It's like chasing a mirage on the horizon in an old Western movie. You'll never find it because it doesn't actually exist. But when we build our vision with revelation that comes from the Lord and his word, what does it say we will discover? Happiness and blessing. That is a promise of fulfillment right there. 
Anybody else want to experience the fulfillment of God's plan in their life? So what's the goal, Hill Church, with this series? We are challenging you to invite the revelation of God into your vision to be your hope, your plan, and your future. In the first week, our lead pastor introduced six areas that can so easily become unrestrained when we leave them unaccounted for. Our spiritual life, our physical life, our mental health, our family, our finances, and in our selfishness. And it's okay if you didn't get a chance to write all those down because you can look back, back at our notes and see them all listed there. But the challenge is to invite the revelation of God and his word into each of these areas of our life. And then Kirsten, isn't she just so great? I love her. <laughs> I'm biased, but I just love her. Last week talked about the importance of taking action in these areas. What's a plan worth if we don't do anything with the plan? Am I right? And I love the statement that she said, what we spend our time looking at will expand. And ultimately, what we expand will initiate the behaviors we either do or do not take. Kirsten took us to Numbers 13, where the Israelites stood on the brink of the promised land, about to step, and they were steps away from experiencing the fulfillment of promise in their life. And yet, they didn't. In fact, they were turned away to roam the desert for another 40 years because they had expanded the wrong things. So I want to ask you again the question that she left us with. What are you expanding in your life? You know, you can find a lot about a person, about the things that they spend their time looking at. It's like our bank account. You can tell a lot about a person when you, when you just start to shift through or scroll through someone's bank statement. Am I right? What we spend our money on sends a lot, says a lot about who we are as people. And what you spend your time looking at will tell a lot about who you are as a person. Because chances are it will reveal what you are expanding. Think about it. You spend a lot of your time scrolling through Amazon at all the things you wish you could buy. Checking out people when they walk by you, comparing yourself to them. Other people's lives on social media, pornography. These are windows into what is going on in here and therefore in here. But we're going to take this thought a step further this morning because there are other windows into your heart, more ways that we can expand the things that maybe we shouldn't. Did you know that of all of our senses... Our sight and our hearing are the most connected. They are literally connected. They, in fact, have a, a link or a nerve that physically links them uh, to create what we call the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Say that 10 times really quick. <laughs> this reflex connects the inner ear muscles to uh, the movements of your eyes, the muscles that are around your eyes. Now, what does that mean for us in, in uh, normal people language? your eyes will automatically move to the source of what you are hearing. This is a completely automatic response as a part of our survival instinct. So you can respond to what is making the sound. And in the same way, just as our eyes and our ears work together to create a complete grasp and perception of the world around us and how we can protect ourselves from it, they also work hand in hand to create our balance or to keep us balanced. Vertigo is the state of disorientation or dizziness that comes when sight and hearing are not working together. And some of us in our spiritual and emotional lives are experiencing vertigo, dizziness, and disorientation. And maybe it's because we're looking at the right things but not listening to the wrong words. Or, or maybe it's the reverse. We're fighting to listen to the right voices but we're not changing the things we're spending our time looking at and therefore expanding. Jesus addresses the importance of guarding what we allow ourselves to see and hear in Matthew 13. After his disciples ask him why he speaks in parables so often, because it's very clear to them that the Jewish leaders are not picking up what Jesus is laying down. They're not getting the parables. And so they're saying, they're asking him, why do you do this so often? And this is what Jesus says in response. In them... Being the Jewish leaders is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. 
For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. You see, when we spend our time listening and looking at the wrong things, our eyes and our ears begin to become callous to the things of God. It is our responsibility to steward these gifts, and that's what they are. They are gifts from the Lord to steward these gifts well. And it makes me think of the Israelites standing at the shore of the Jordan, peering over at the promised land. They are steps away from, with 10 spies on one side and Joshua and Caleb on the other, trusting the promise of God, trying to convince them to see what they're seeing. Could it be that these 10 men, these spies that were opposing Caleb and Joshua, that had seen so much of the goodness and the wonder and the power of God, that they could not see the potential promise fulfilled in front of them because their eyes and their ears had become callous to the things of God? What had they spent so much time looking at and listening to that they started to miss the move of God? When was it that they lost track of the goodness of their Lord, the faith for the impossible? And I think if I'm being truthful this morning, I could probably ask myself the same questions. And one thing we know for sure is that Joshua and Caleb, they knew the voice of God because they saw something different. When they looked across the Jordan at this promised land full of giant men and giant fruits, They saw the goodness of God, not the imminent defeat like the other ten did. What had they been spending their time looking at that protected their eyes and their ears from becoming so callous? I mean, all 12 of these men were in the same camp, living the same timeline, on the same road, underneath the same leader. What did Joshua and Caleb do that these other ten did not? Well, as for Joshua... That's what we're going to dive into together this morning. And I want to take you to a special place in Scripture where this Joshua, this young man, is introduced to us as a young man. He's mentioned only one time before this under a different name entirely. But here we find him not as the leader or the spy or the conqueror that he would become later in his life. It was before all that. Here we find Joshua as just a simple young man who knew the power of enlisting the right habits. If you open with me to Exodus 33, starting with verse 7, this passage is called the Tent of Meeting. And it says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it at a distance outside the camp. He called it the Tent of Meeting, and anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the Tent of Meeting outside the camp. Now the context here, I want to... Make sure that you understand that this place of meeting was not the most holy place. This was not the tabernacle that is set up. The the, the instructions for setting up the tabernacle uh, are in Exodus 25 to 31. This was not that place. This was something separate, something unique to this time that we don't really see happen again when it comes to the Israelites. We don't know necessarily why it happened. There's a lot of theologians that have their theories But what we do know is that this tent was pitched a good distance from the camp. And sometimes I think we forget the pragmatics of what this really must have looked like when we read scripture. We forget what this camp probably looked like. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not much of a camper. I've tried camping. I tried this past year. I went with some good friends of mine, and it didn't work out for me. We left early because I was throwing up, and it just... It didn't work out. Now, um, this was a different kind of camp because we camped with three people. Inside of the camp that um, was the Israelite nation, there was two million people. Can you imagine camping with two million people? (laughs) Two million people. That is over 160,000 tents. Everyone trying to move together in unison. Everyone getting their share of manna and quail in the morning, running around trying to hunt those little birds all the time. Everyone unpacking and then repacking every day over and over. Talk about noise and chaos. 
Now, it probably would have been much easier for Moses to pitch this tent in the middle of the camp, maybe where the tabernacle was. Save yourself the trip when you can, right? Because then when you had a question for the Lord, then you could just like hit up the tent of meeting on your way to Fry's in the middle of your day, you know? Like, I'm running my errands, I got a question for the Lord, so I'm just going to hit him up in between my, 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 my grocery shopping, you know? That would be great. But no, Moses very intentionally pitched the tent a distance outside of the camp, which meant the people of Israel would have to leave the camp to go there. They would have to leave their daily routines. They'd have to leave their mundane, take a break from their errands, and make time to travel to its location. Now, I'm just going to be real here. I've, I've, been, I've been real about, about my inadequacies and not finishing projects, so we can be real, right? I think that in many of our lives, the reason we're not hearing the right things or we're not seeing the right things nor do we know the voice of God and what he might be saying in our lives is because we have been unwilling to break away from the routines, the schedules, and the timelines that govern our life to be with him. As believers, we have forgotten how to set apart a sacred space that is reserved only for him, a tent of meeting, so to say, Away from all the noise, all the chaos, all the convenience. Some of y'all just need to put your phones down, all right? That's what I'm trying to say. Did you know that on average, a person will see up to 10,000 advertisements every day? Logos, strategic forms of communication, 10,000 attempts to try and grab your attention. Now, I was talking to my wife about this this week, and she was like, there's no way that that's true. And I said, I found this in three different sources. And she's like, I don't understand it. But if you really think about it, how much, spo- how much time we spend on our devices? And psychologists would agree that, that they would go as far as to say that when you're scrolling through social media, that literally every video, every photo that you see is potentially an advertisement because it's trying to draw you into a profile or a thought process. Everybody wants a piece of you. Buy this. Drink this, eat this, look like this, think like this, spend this, do this, be like her, look like him. You need these. Don't miss out. This is the language, the dialogue of our life all the time. No wonder studies in psychology are saying that our young people are more emotionally, mentally, and socially strained than ever before in human history. Because our cognition was not designed to handle that level of stimulus. Our brains never get a break. From the moment we wake up, what's the first thing so many of us do? We get on a device. And what's the last thing we do before we go to bed? We get on a device. Those are the bookends. That doesn't include all the stuff in between. Not to mention our children, pressures at work, whatever things you need to get done today, whatever phase of life you feel like you might be in, just adding to the distraction of it all. It is a fight to escape the wild and chaotic noise that is our camp and our culture. It takes a conscious decision to get away, just like it did for the Israelites. They would have to plan ahead, think with intentional foresight, and give effort to leave their busy days behind and literally hike to the location of the tent of meeting. And it will require the same of us, the same effort, The same planning ahead. Wake up earlier. Go to bed later. Find a time and space where you can put down your phone. Silence the voices. Put on some worship music. Open your word. Go on a walk and be with him. Jumping back into verse 8. Then whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand at the entrances to their own tents and watch Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and remain at the entrance, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they would stand up and worship each one at the entrance to his own tent. Now, I want to take note of something here. A really important detail so we can understand what's really happening. Back in verse 7, when it says that Moses pitched a tent outside of camp and called it the tent of meeting, 
Who did it say this tent was pitched for? Moses? The leaders? The elders? The priests? No, it didn't say any of that. It said anyone inquiring of the Lord. Anyone was welcome. Everyone was welcome to this tent of meeting. Moses did not just pitch this tent for himself, but this was a tent of meeting for everybody. And yet here in Scripture, we see the account of only one that took the Lord up on this offer. What does it say the people did? All the people would stand at the entrances to their tents, and what would they do? Watch. They would watch until Moses had entered. They could have just as easily approached the tent themselves, and yet they watched Moses go instead. And in the same way, I think so many of us watch what the Lord is doing from the opening of our tents, never fully experiencing what he wants for us on the inside of the tent, what he's offering to us. So what do you think keeps you and your tent instead of going to his, visiting the Lord in that sacred space? And through the years, I've seen a variety of things that have kept me in my tent. At times, it's been my sin. I think sin often keeps us in our tent because we're ashamed to leave our tent. Because there's risk, right? To approach the holiness of God means that he's going to call us out of the things that can't be in his presence, right? Because he's holy. He is righteousness. He's going to call us out. And not to mention, when we go to his tent, well, we leave our tent unattended, which means someone might be able to peek in and actually see what's really going on. We're trying to hide inside of our tent. And someone else might call you out on the things you know you shouldn't be doing. You know what the real risk is in both of these scenarios? It's a risk of reprimand and a call to change. And the truth is we don't really want to change, do we? Come on. If we really wanted to face the addictions and the sin patterns in our life, then for Pete's sake, you'd get your little booty to CR on Tuesdays, okay? It's every Tuesday. Same time, same place, okay? It's not going anywhere. Well, Tuesdays don't really work with my schedule, Zion. Well, there's other CRs. I, I, I can name them off for you. All over the valley, every day of the week, there's a CR. Well, Zion, I've got social anxiety. I've tried these things in the past. I've tried to, to do these programs, and they've just never really worked out for me. Awesome. Good for you. You can hang out in your tent then. You can hang out in all the filth that you're pretending isn't there. You can keep doing what you're doing because it seems to be working for you, doesn't it? You see, the thing about sin is, well, it's sin. It's unclean. It's rot. It's dead. And, well, dead things smell really bad. Last year, I was fighting a war with a critter in my garage. We are fighting. We were, like, duking it out hardcore every day. And I know that I had won because I walked into my garage once, and, boy, did it smell bad. And I said, the war is over. <laughs> It's over because the little critter was deceased. And the truth is, dead things smell. And some of us live in that same stench in our life, that rot of sin. It's all over our home. And instead of doing anything about it, we just live in the stench. In fact, we make our kids live in it too. It's in our marriages. It's on our clothes. It follows us to work with our stinky attitude. And the more we live in it, the more acquainted to it we become. You know how you can get used to a smell after a while? Maybe you walk into a location and you're like, "Woo, it is bad in here. But then about an hour later, you don't even smell it anymore. It's only a matter of time before you and your kids don't smell it anymore. Because it's likely they're probably following in the same behaviors and the same thought processes. You want to know what's scary about sin? Like really scary about sin? We don't like to talk about this very much in the church because it's real. Let's break open Ephesians 2. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You see, when we live like we're dead among trespasses and sins, you know, all the dead stuff that smells, the prince of the power of the air begins to work in us. And you know who the prince of the power of the air is? Satan. 
He will never leave a space unoccupied in your life. There is no such thing as a vacancy for Satan. Because the moment you begin to separate from the presence of God and you leave those gaps open, the ones that were reserved for the Lord's presence, that they begin to empty because you are filling your life with disobedience, your sin blinks like a vacancy sign above your head to the enemy. Your sin invites the enemy to begin to work in your life. And I know you might tell yourself, well, it's fine. Nobody knows. I have it under control. I can assure you that's not true. Because the prince of the power of the air will start to work, and he'll make sure of it. It will only get worse with every disobedient decision you make. And I know that sounds dark and intense, and we're being real this morning, but I want you to know that there's good news, because this is not the end of the story. We might be able to be separated from his presence by our sin, but do you know what we can never be separated from? For I'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else. And all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Jesus Christ in our Lord. Romans 8, 38. For the wages of sin may be death, but the gift of God is eternity in Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't have to stay there It doesn't matter how messy it feels in your tent, how bad it smells, how much of a failure you feel like. We can have righteousness through Christ Jesus and the strength that he has given us through the power of the cross. And nothing can separate us from the love that was displayed for you and me when he hung on that tree that day. Nothing can separate us from what he did for us. He wants you to help you clean up that mess. That's why he went through that bloody day so he could sit with you in your mess and help you clean it up. Jesus is waiting at the tent of meeting. He's waiting for you. The first step, just get there. Just get there and he'll do the rest. At other times, it wasn't sin that kept me from community with the Lord, but it was comparison. Boy, have I wasted so much time evaluating my life, comparing it to things that don't really matter. I would look at the success and blessing of others, you know, their money, their body, their influence, even their faith, their tent of meeting, so to say. All that God is doing in their life and their family and their ministry. And instead of rejoicing, even joining them on the journey, I would look at them with jealousy instead. Why can't I have that? I wish my tent of meeting were those colors, you know? I wish I had that kind of anointing. That tent of meeting just looks so much bigger than mine. Why can't I have that kind of blessing in my life? In a world where we spend so much time looking at everybody else's life, it's so easy to start merely observing everyone else's tent of meeting and wishing we could be there instead of finding our own tent of meeting. It's like we treat the blessings of God like there's a limit, a finite end and beginning. Like it's energy governed by a law of conservation. You're like, what? Did I just walk into a physics class? I did spend a lot of time in my undergrad doing chemistry and physics, and we're going to do a quick physics lesson together. Are you ready? Got my teaching tools over here. You see, the law of conservation of energy states that there is no energy in a system that can be made or lost. All it can do is be moved. It's like the water that I'm putting here in this cup. You all see it here. This is the energy in the system. And according to this law, it cannot change. It can be moved, but when I move it, it comes at the expense of it being here. I can move it back, but it comes at the expense of it being here. We treat the blessing of God like this. That to experience or see blessing in somebody else's life, it's actually kind of intimidating for us because it means that, well, then it must be at the expense of my own blessing. Well, if he's doing that for them, then he certainly can't do it for me. Or maybe I compensate for it and I try to own it. I try to earn the blessing because the moment I know that it's removed from me, it might start happening to somebody else. And we just pass the blessing back and forth. That sounds exhausting, doesn't it? That doesn't sound like the Bible, does it? 
when do we hear that the blessings of God are on a budget? Come on. That's not the way he works. This is what scripture says about the goodness of God. His goodness is always with us. Everything good comes from God. He fills our hungry souls with good things. He is good, does good, and gives good gifts to his children. God is the definition of goodness. He is goodness. His presence cannot help but bring goodness and therefore blessing because it's who he is. Now, if God is the definition of goodness, then I think it's safe to say that his capacity can handle maybe a very generous bank account when it comes to blessing. If he wants to bless you to overflowing, then he'll bless you to overflowing because it's who he is. He is blessing, and it's not at the expense of anybody else. He'll just bring it with him when he comes because it's who he is. So that said, we have to stop evaluating our lives through the lens of everybody else's blessing, being at the expense of our own because they may have gone to the tent of meeting, but just because they're at the tent of meeting doesn't mean it's at capacity. We can go there too because the Lord is anticipating a conversation with you. He saved it just for you. And that's why he wants to see you there. So just get to the tent of meeting. And then lastly, as much as I don't want to admit it, my own apathy has kept me at my tent. You know, laziness, selfishness. If it puts me first, then you can bet I've done it. And you probably have too. It's so interesting what the people did when the presence of God moved to the tent in the form of the cloud. Did you catch it? They would move to the opening of their tent when Moses started to go towards it. And then when the cloud would fall, what did it say? They would stand and worship. Now, I never thought about this before because on the surface observation, I mean, they're doing the right thing. It would appear that the Israelites are doing what is necessary in this situation. They're revering the presence of God. There's nothing really inherently wrong with what they're doing, but what changes the dynamic is when we remember that the same invitation was given to them as it was Moses. This was not something that was reserved for Moses. The tent of meeting was for them too. They could go, but instead they went through the motions at a distance and let Moses do the real work on their account. Now, this is the culture of modern Christianity, a surface-level commitment that wants the pastor to do all the work so we can reap the benefits. As long as I'm here Sunday, I can do whatever I want the rest of the days of the week, all right? You know, in fact, as long as I'm here once a month, I'm good to go. That pastor, they got it going on. I'll hear them. I'll hear their revelation of the word. I'll cash in my Christian card, and then I'll resume back to my life. Don't ask me to change my life, because I won't. Don't ask me to move out of living with my girlfriend, because it's my life. It's our best financial situation right now. So don't, don't get in my world. That's my business. I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me to have sex. You're just telling me not to have sex because you're the pastor, okay? You have to say that. You don't know what I'm working through. You don't know the wounds that I'm compensating for. This is what makes me feel good. Don't ask me to tithe. That's my money. I work for that money. Someone else will give. Someone who's a little bit richer or wealthier than I am, they'll take care of the situation. Ooh, it's awful quiet in here. This is the reason why we're conforming our faith to accommodate the demands of political platforms. We'd rather change what we believe than change our behavior. Ouch. That one got you in the gut. And that is a risky road. I'm going to be sarcastic here for a few seconds, okay? Now, just because we've decided to introduce new interpretations and revelations of the Word of God as though suddenly our human intelligence is now capable of coming up with new perspectives and ideas on this God-breathed manual that is the Bible that has been completely sufficient for over 1,000 years until we decided we didn't like the things that it was saying. Well, just because you have that perception doesn't mean the Word of God is changing with you. The Word of God is not adjusting to our inclusivity. It's protecting His divinity. We can't change what it says. We can't change what it says just because we don't want to spend the cost of changing ourselves. 
This is our problem, not his. Let's just call this what it is, all right? We want eternity without the cost. And it's going to be unfortunate someday when those who have spent so much time trying to accommodate the word of God to the lives they wanted to live and, if, and in effect never got to experience the fullness of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He's not going to let you drag your chains into heaven because it makes a mockery of the price that he paid for our freedom. He died for all that. He loves you too much to let you spend eternity in your chains. And there he is in that sacred place waiting just for you so that we can talk about it, so that you can talk about it, so you can inquire of the Lord, ask your questions. Because I know there's a lot of pain in this world. I know you've had to walk through some stuff. But he's waiting in the tent of meet, meeting just saying, come and talk to me about it. Ask me the questions. They don't scare me. I want to sit with you so we can be together through this. Just look what it says in the next scripture. It says, thus the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as man speaks to his friend. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible because it gives such a window into the intent of our God. The whole point of all of this, this whole thing, it's not the formalities, the accolades, us trying to earn the grace of God because we'll never be able to do that. All of that frames this image of our God, what the Lord has desired from the very beginning, to speak to us as friends. That's why he created us, to share a friendship with him. To go to the tent of meeting means to share friendship with the Lord. That's what Moses was going to do, was to go and be friends with the Lord. And I realize we're talking a lot about Moses this morning. You're like, Zion, I thought we were talking about Joshua. Did you forget? I promise, I did not forget. I wanted to land here. Two years ago, I had this conversation that changed my life. It was at Portillo's. Anybody like some Portillo's? Hot dogs, anybody? Is that Portillo's sitting across from Pastor Preston and his wife, the lead pastors of Pillar Church, previously Gateway, the ones who gave us, really, this building. And I remember I was sitting across from him, but I was not eating a bite because I was so nervous. Because this was in the middle of this whole transition. And I talked way too much because I was trying to impress him. I was trying to look cool. I was trying to make sure that he knew that we had the capacity for this. I was trying to make sure that I didn't blow this deal because I really wanted that building. So I just kept talking and talking. And I remember at one point he said, Zion, can you just stop trying so hard? Can you just like stop trying? And then he said this. The Lord told me I was going to give this building to a God-fearing Joshua-like people. And at the time, I didn't fully know what that meant. But then Preston recited Exodus 33, verse 11. Thus the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. As a man speaks to his friend, we just read that, right? But then here it comes. Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the tent. And he looked straight in my eyes across the table or Portillo's hot dogs underneath us. He said, Zion, are you Joshua? Will you be like Joshua? Will you stay in the tent even after everybody else has left? Do you want Jesus more than you want the success? More than you want this building? More than anything else? And with tears in my eyes, I remember I looked at him and I said, I want to. I want to be like Joshua. And then without hesitation, he said, well, then learn to linger. Because the more you linger, you'll learn to listen. Because you'll know his heart, Zion. And the Holy Spirit is asking us the same question this morning. 2911 Church, a Joshua-minded people. Do you want Jesus more than anything else? Because Preston believed in him. 
He gave us this building because he believed in it. The mantle of this house, to be a people who were being more committed to the tent of meeting with our God than we were the success and the glory and the growth. Because you see, the more we linger, the more we listen. Because the more we get to know the heart of God. And when we know his heart, we will always hear his voice. Because we know it. One of the joys of my life right now is watching Brooks, our three-month-old, experience the world for the first time. He's got these big eyes, if you've ever seen him. And he's just taking it all in all the time. I just see him looking at it all, the colors, hearing the sounds and the noises. But even in all the experiences he's having, the thing that makes him smile is the sound of my voice as his dad. It lights up his world because he knows it. He knows my voice because I spent way too much time talking around Kirsten the nine months she was pregnant, just talking and talking and talking. And he's just in there listening and listening and listening. He knows my voice. And so when I speak, despite all of the noise that's around him, it's something he's familiar with. There's a familiarity, a safety with my voice. And he lights up. And I want to know the voice of God like that. And the only way I will know it is if I can learn to linger, to stay in the tent just a little bit longer. And church, the question is, will you stay with me? Will you stay with me? Come close to God, James says, and God will come close to you. Can we draw near to the Lord long enough for him to draw near to us? Because church, we've got some big things ahead of us this year. We can't afford to not know what the sound of his voice is. we got to get a building up on that slab. Not because we're just trying to grow this church, but because there are hurting families in our city that need saving. Our state and our country, people are aching for the truth of Jesus Christ. We need to know the voice of God so when that the time comes, when we're standing on the side, on the brink of walking into the promised land, on the shore of the Jordan, when he asks us to take bigger steps than we've ever done before, that we can go forward and embrace the impossible. We can be more generous than we've ever been, more courageous than we've ever been, pray harder than we ever have. You see, there's a promise in store for those who will stay in the tent, not because they're better or because they deserve more blessing, but because where they go, so does his blessing. Remember, God is blessing. And when we live in his presence, his blessing can't help but follow. And you know, my conversations with the Lord has changed since that conversation at Portillo's. It's changed quite a bit because I spend less time asking for things. I mean, I pray with faith over our staff and over my family and over this house. I pray big prayers. But more than that, I spend my time looking at his face and listening to his voice. Because I know as long as I'm with him, I will do and I will be and I will say exactly what he intended. And I don't want to be anywhere else but that place.